Hello everyone, um, you already saw who I am and what I do and how boring I am in the first talk in this conference, so I'm going to skip over all this boring stuff here. Um, I'm here to talk about doctrine. Uh, again, I need to mention uh, where we come from. We are persistence oriented, we come from Hibernate, and that is again because the Hibernate guys pretty much told us, why don't you ever mention us? So they are awesome, and to be honest, if you still mock Java, you should fix that because they know what they're doing. Uh, I'm still looking for contributors. If you're in this room and you think you know everything about doctrine and you know the internals and you want to help out and you're very excited about complicated code and getting something that really changes the PHP world, then come and help us. If you help us, I don't know, design the next doctrine tree, whenever that happens, you are going to change how pretty much all the world of PHP Enterprise PHP works. I'm not even kidding here. Like pretty much every project that I work on at enterprise level uses this thing. So you want to eventually help with that. And you need to be prepared to take very unpopular decisions. So you must be a person that knows when to say no. We're not going to build this. Anyway, if you think you can help, just come and chat with me. If you don't know, then still come and chat with me. We can find something for you, okay? It's fine. All right, we're talking about Doctrine or I'm, I'm going to skip on what it is because I bragged around, uh, around this in the first talk anyway. This is about Doctrine to best practices. So, how many of you don't use Doctrine? All right, this talk has suggestions for you, but it may not be the talk for you, okay? Just so you know. Also, another warning, this talk has a lot of stuff in it, so I'm going to be very, very fast. And I know I got bad reviews because of that, but you are warned. The slides are online, so you can just take them, throw them at your coworkers, and hopefully have them learn something. That is why I do this talk, so that there's documentation about this stuff later on. So the first thing that I need you to understand is that you need to know your enemy whenever you build an application, and you need to be sure that you don't make your tool your enemy. Um, very often people just build these applications of the framework in it and then the framework is uh, everywhere. And now suddenly we're in 2015 and you're stuck with the first version of Cake PHP. How many people still use the Cake PHP version with 5.2 support? All right, that's good, that's good. There's a couple hands up. This happens, okay? You built yourself a system and now you can't escape from it. So you need to be sure of that. The other suggestion is really you have to be read to re read the documentation. Reading an example and building something starting from the example doesn't really get you anywhere. You will be able to build something simple, <coughs> but then when the hard problems come up, you're gonna be in panic. So knowledge is power, okay? Not everyone agrees with that. Um, okay, there's other sorts of power, but I think that knowing what is going on is going to help you a lot. So, uh, first of all, before starting a project, you need to be sure if an ORM is an appropriate tool. So in this case, at least Doctrine ORM is a tool that is mainly suited for one type of application, which is OLTP applications. OLTP is pretty much take this data, create, I don't know, shopping cart, commit it. That is a transaction, online transaction. Small, little changes that you control and you can keep under control is designed for DDD style applications, which I already bragged about in the first talk, and it's about fast prototyping. So if you are working with a team that designs all the database before starting working on the application, maybe this is not the right tool for you. Don't, and I think it's anachronistic in 2015 to still build applications database first. It's a bad idea. Don't build data database first for a new application there are companies where this is mandated. You, this is a culture that needs to change. You need to first focus on what you want to build and then focus on how to build it. And a lot of people instead start from how to build it, which is the database, and then build it from ground up. Okay, so that is pretty much something that needs to change. It's object-oriented first, so if you're dealing with massive amount of data, mapping over data, filtering a lot of data, you don't really want to use the ORM. You maybe use something like a functional approach 
or a table data gateway approach. What is it not for? You don't want to have any dynamic data in it. This is what NoSQL databases are for. This is what Postgres with the JSON support is for, uh, which, by the way, is much better than MongoDB on that side if you want to try it out. It's quite impressive. Um, so you don't want dynamic data into, in your database. You don't want to have EAV structures. Uh, so like, for example, the Magento schema. Magento has these EAV structures that are very inefficient. You may want to instead store blob fields with mixed data in there or use Elasticsearch for searches. So you want to split anything that is dynamic outside the scope of your ORM. Reporting is not something that this tool is for. You are not going to do any reporting with your ORM. You're going to do it with SQL. And this is what SQL is built for. So don't try to fit the SQL to this tool. And anyway, it's a query language, so it's the perfect fit. It was designed for this. So use SQL. Don't be, don't be afraid of using SQL, of optimizing it, of learning its internals. It's, it's really a powerful language, and it's going to stick around for another 50 years at least. OK? It existed for pretty much 50 years, so yeah. So where do we start? Um, these were pretty much the just when to use it and when not. The first thing you do when you design a system that works with your ORM is starting with entities, of course. So um, one thing that must be absolutely clear is that entities must work even without the ORM. You must be able to design your entity relation graph without having any ORM plug plugged in. This means your application, you can build an entity, use it in your system, and fake out anything that has to do with saving and loading, and it must still work. And it is must work without the DB. This allows you to swap out the DB to change the DB underlying it, or to change even how an entity is saved. Because if you are not satisfied with how the ORM deals with it, you can say, oh yeah, I'm going to manually save this how I prefer to do it. Entities pretty much represent your domain, pretty much. They represent how you store things that are critical to your business. So they must be represented in such a way that they're very near to the terminology of your business. Um, the database is just about saving things. So using the ORM is just a secondary thing. You first design the entities. So that's it. You just define the database after having modeled this stuff. Um, the ORM can generate it for you, or you can fine tune it. But again, don't start database first. You're going to build yourself a big trap that is very hard to get out of. So you design the mappings on the entities after having designed the entities. Let's go into entity design specifically. So um, who, who recognizes this? This is a user object, as a username, password, setter, getter, setter, getter, right? This is perfectly standard, I would say. It's in every tutorial, actually. Every tutorial uses this. So entities are not typed arrays. Um, you don't build an object and then store data in it and just add some times to it, types to it. It's, it's not really useful to do that. You have no interactions between one entity and the other. Uh, you are just building yourself a big state coupling there. So what you should have is you should have entities that have a behavior. The internal state of an entity is irrelevant. You may uh, design the behavior first in such a way that you can then design the saving and the loading of entities in whatever more efficient way uh, it is for you. So the internal state is completely irrelevant. And you can design how you save the information inside the entity, because it's private stuff. You design it after designing the API. So if you design the state first, so you make first the properties and then the API around the properties, then you're going to have state coupling all around your application. Every object is asking for state about other objects. And now you can't change any way of how you save the data. Here's a better example of our user. So we have a banned flag, we have a username, we have a password hash, and now we have a two, two nickname. I call them two nickname rather than get nickname. 
And the point here is that I am casting my user to a different type. It's not actually getting something from the user. You see, it is still a getter, but I'm actually representing the interaction here. I want my user as a uh, string. Uh, I have an authenticate method which does some interactions about the authentication. I pass in a check hash callable which allows me to check if the password hash that is given is valid. And uh, then I have also uh, a check against has active bounds which I didn't design here. I have a change pass method which allows me to store the password given a hasher. So you see that this API from the outside, if you look at it and you don't know how it's built inside, it kind of expresses what you can do with an object rather than what is in the object. If you don't have any behavior like this, then you probably don't need an ORM. You may just load and save arrays or load and save structs, which is perfectly okay. If you use struct and the functional approach to design your applications, that is perfectly okay. Now. Uh, since we don't pass around state, we can actually respect the low of the meter. Um, does anybody not know what the low of the meter is? Come on, don't be shy. Low of the meter. Okay, the low of the meter, which I can't remember the guy, the story of the guy, but the low of the meter pretty much says don't talk to your neighbor's neighbors. Talk, talk only to your neighbors. Um, I don't know if you do this in Poland, but ki children, when they're really uh, young, they do this game, and I say to the next person a word, and this person says it to the next person, and the next person, and the next person. Okay, so I say lion, okay, and on the other side comes out poop. Okay, happens all the time. So this is pretty much the law of the meter. You are not talking to people on the other side of the chain. This is because it, many, many things can happen in a chain. So you avoid having these chains. You don't get the thing, get the other thing, get the other thing, and then do something. That is the first thing. So here's a violation of the law of the meter. We have a user object. User object uh, has an API that tells us has the user access to a given resource, and it gives us back a Boolean. I now code everything in PHP 7. Everything I do is PHP 7. Uh, and it's so much better, by the way. So here, what I'm doing is I'm filtering and I'm checking if there's at least one resource, one access level um, in the roles, in the role of the user. So this means I'm using all the access levels of the role owned by the user. So I'm talking to the <coughs> access level, which is the neighbor of the role, and I'm checking if I can access that. So what you do is you get rid of that and you change it like this. Now this is pretty much then very simple, but what I did is I simply took this code and moved it into the role object, okay? I'm just delegating uh, API, and this makes it so much simpler to work with. And also, if my role changes ways in how uh, the entire access levels work, then it can, it can be redesigned completely. If anybody works with Symfony here, you know how painful it is to work with all the voter system or stuff like that. So all the security system is also changing now in Symfony 3. So you may need to redesign all that. If you design it like this, so you talk only to the last endpoint, then you're not going to have a big problem. But if you design everything so that you get all the details about the authentication domain inside your stuff, then you're going to have a problem. This is more expressive, it's easier to understand here. It's much easier to test, we can just eventually mock it out and then just verify that we're calling a method. We have less coupling because now we don't have any type hinting. We don't have any type hinting against the access level, the access level type hint that is an import in our class. We don't have it here. We don't even know that there is an access level here. So there's no coupling with that. It's much more flexible because I can swap out the entire logic of the role and it's much easier to refactor because it's one line of code. Since we respect the law of the meter, we are going to also disallow access to collections from outside the entity. So what I see recurrently from people is something like this. And this happens a lot when you work with, for example, Symfony forms or Zen form or uh, 
well, API that has access to all the state of your application. So you have a get bans, so you get a user and you have a bans collection, and then you want to ban a user. This is, I don't know, somewhere in a service layer or in a controller or whatever it's, it's doing that or command handler. You find the user, you get the bans of the user, and then you add a new ban, okay? This is, first of all, a, lim a Demeter law violation, but um, we are also changing the internal state of the user by side effects, because the internal state of the user has a by reference, uh, um, reference to the bans collection, and this means that we change state outside the, the user and we are affecting the state inside the user. So this is very, very buggy. When it hits you, good luck debugging, debugging and stuff like this. This is where you spend hours and hours and hours debugging. So you keep collections hidden inside your entities. This means that anywhere you want to return a collection, you are going to cast it to array so that you can't mutate it from the outside. But here's a better example. So what I have is my, I have my user object and the user object actually has a ban method. So we are coding it as an interaction on the user object. We are now fetching the user from the repository and we are banning the user. This is much more expressive. We are interacting with this aggregate, which is the user, for those who work with, um, with the DDD workshop from Matthias. This is pretty much the idea. You just hide things and make them accessible only with certain rules. Entity validity, really? Um, this happens all the time. So people just create an entity and then keep checking, is it valid, is it valid, is it valid? And when it's valid, they save it. This doesn't really work. Uh, oh, it's chunked off. There is no Dana, there is only Zool for those who watch Ghostbusters. Um, but the idea is, your objects must always stay in a valid state. This makes it so much easier to reason about. Once you build an entity, an instance, it must be valid at all times. Any invalid state, you should move it outside to a different object. This means that when you want to use something like a user object or a blog post object, and then bind it to a form, this happens all the time. You say form bind entity, for those using Symfony or Zen Framework, this is how you do it usually. This means that your user object is going to be populated with data from the form and then it may or may not be valid at the end. What you do is instead, and there's a good article by Bernard Schusek, which is the author of the Symfony form component, you use something called a DTO, which is a data transfer object, which is a pretty much a fake object that is not your entity, it just has fields that are similar to the ones of your entities, and you save any temporary state, any intermediate state in there. Your entity instead, it must be built from the DTO eventually, but it must stay valid after construct. After construct, your entity is valid, period. Any method call that causes state to be in an inconsistent uh, condition, is to be banished. You throw exceptions, you prevent anything uh, from changing the state in such a way that you have broken stuff in there. So you don't want any DB stuff here. You, your entity should be always valid. And you can eventually use a named constructor to have different sources of data to construct the entity always in the different way. Since we are ensuring validity, uh, we are coding everything as an interaction. We now get rid also of the setters. Uh, set get, that needs to die. You don't need set get. Um, because it's otherwise you're just, again, having this state coupling. So, other things that you need to do. Um, avoid coupling with the application layer. Your entity works without the database. It also needs to work without your application. Your entity should just work on its own with the other entities. It should not work with your form component, it should not depend on your controllers, it should not depend on uh, um, any validator inside your application. The entity should be free to live on its own. Here are two examples of kind of bad API. The first one is the very typical one. We are binding the user object to the form, 
and then we're doing something with it. Um, and that causes coupling to the form, not as in the user knows about the form, but we, as developers, are going to design the form to comply with the user structure. And when we can't do that, because we find limitations in how the form stuff works, we are going to change the user so that it works with the form. This happens every time again. We are lazy, so we're going to find a shortcut, and we're going to build ourselves some API on the user object that doesn't really help us. It just helps the form component to work with our entity. The other approach down here is a bit better. So what we have is we have user from form data. This is what I call the named constructor. It's a static method that is just a different way of constructing the user object. Um, it's static because constructors are also static by design. What we have here as a defect is that my user has a type hint against the form system. So now I have somewhere an import that is from my library, from my application layer, inside my domain layer. Form components, I keep bragging about them. They break entity validity. So both Symfony form and Zen form are quite terrible on this. They're really terrible. Um, as I said, there is a good article about that. I will have to link it in the slides somewhere. But the idea is that for the use case of taking a form and making it manipulate an entity, you probably want to avoid this. As I said before, you want to use a DTO. All right, let's move to other stuff. Um, Lifecycle callbacks. Anybody use any lifecycle callbacks? Oh, lots of hands up. All right. Um, right. Don't. OK. Um, Lifecycle callbacks are persistence hacks. What I see most of the time is people designing a lifecycle callback that says something like, when the entity is updated, set the latest update timestamp to this. This is also how the uh, JEDMO extension for Doctrine works. You just say this is a timestampable entity. Lifecycle callbacks are uh, supposed to be ORM specific serialize and unserialize. Now think about it. Um, you are designing an object, any object, and you write the unserialize function or the serialize function. Would you ever modify the date time inside that object in the unserialize or the serialize? You would probably not do that. You would also not send an email from there. You don't want to serialize an object and send an email. You don't want to I don't know. Do anything that has to do with modifications inside your domain in serialize and unserialize. Things that are valid are things like load an image from the drive. Like I know the path of the image and now I'm going to check where it is on the drive. This is a persistence problem. I'm going to save the image. This is persistence. This is fine with this. But lifecycle callbacks are just the version of serialized and unserialized, but ORM specific. So you just don't use them for business logic. Avoid auto-generated identifiers. So who here uses auto-increment? Everyone. <laughs> I s OK, I got rid of them uh, pretty much in newer applications. Um, who uses UUIDs? Couple of people. OK, who doesn't know what a UUID is? Have you ever heard of a UU? Have you not heard of a UUID? All right. I, feel I see people doing this. Don't worry. It's, I'm not killing you because you don't know. You're here to learn. So if you have generated identifiers, this means that I have to insert something in the database before I get the ID for that object. Now, this means that my object doesn't really exist until I saved it to the database. You see the problem there? It is in memory, it does exist, I can do things with it, but it doesn't really exist in my system because it has no ID. That is kind of breaking things. And also, I can't rely on this object because since I didn't insert it, I can't insert stuff that is related to that object. So you are pretty much denying operations such as bulk inserts because you can't insert a lot of objects and get all the IDs in one shot. This is something that doesn't work with relational databases right now. 
and you can make things like multi-request transactions. So I'm going to build a shopping cart, and then I'm going to save it somewhere that is not the database, because <coughs> for whatever reason, my shopping cart is not yet ready to be shown to the world. But I still want to populate it with things and pass it around. <coughs> okay. Your object is also invalid until it's saved. As I said, after construct, your object must be valid. And your object doesn't work without the database now. This is pretty much the first thing I said about entities. So auto increments are quite annoying. What you can use is this thing, which is a UUID. Um, a UUID is just a very large integer. What you can think of is you keep generating a hundred million UUIDs per second, okay? And until the time you die, well, or in a hundred years, you have the chance of 50% of a chance of having one collision. So this is how unique these numbers are. So you can generate loads of them and you are pretty much sure that they're not going to collide. There are going to be colli uh, collisions but it's much less likely than, I don't know, a sequence breaking somewhere. So a UID is just a very big integer. It's a 128-bit integer, so just don't save it as a string. Um, and here is how you use it. There is a library in PHP which is called Ramsey UUID, written by Ben Ramsey. <laughs> and this is how you use it. Very simple. <coughs> Instead of having your objects having this ID and auto-generated syntax and whatever, just store a UUID in it, and that's it. This is, well, on the other side, you lose the sorting functionality. You don't know which record came first and which one came next. So what you may want to do in those cases is you may instead have something like a date time or a timestamp or a micro time precise timestamp in order to sort records. But you don't really need auto increment. Auto increment is actually really, really messy. Since we are talking about primary keys, we can also avoid any derived primary key. A derived primary key is anything that is a primary key that is a foreign key to a different ID to a different entity. You don't need that. Um, this is something that if you tell it to your DBA, He's gonna take your skull, okay? He's gonna try to kill you or something, but um, you're just normalizing for the sake of it. You're just trying to follow the book here and trying to normalize things. This makes sense sometimes, but most of the times there is very little business value on it. Does your domain really need to have this identifier to be a derived identifier referencing another table? It's complicated, it's messy. So derived primary keys are pretty much a mess to deal with. Other things that you want to avoid is composite primary keys. Instead of having a primary key, you just make it a unique index and then just assign a UUID. Now, um, I realize here I'm just talking about stuff that anybody that did SQL uh, at university and is like bragging all the time about the third normal form of databases is gonna like shoot at me. You just really store a UUID. Databases like CouchDB, uh, MongoDB and stuff like that, they just assign an identifier by default to any record that you insert. So it simplifies by a lot. What you can do is you can add constraints to that. But by default, it is simply just adding an ID by default. If you use Postgres, Postgres is even doing this for you. It's not safe to rely on, but it's quite useful to know that it, it's working. So is there any reason why you can't use a constraint, a unique constraint instead of a primary key? Uh, does it really make a difference from a business perspective for you? Or are you just trying to be very precise here? Right? As I said, we are designing object first, so it needs to first work with all the interactions, and then you can optimize these details. If you are able to use a, prom a composite primary key, nice, but it's usually just complicating things. Favor immutable entities. Immutable entities, um, it's kind of a 
a contradiction because an entity has an ID and all the data usually changes in there. But what you can do is you can design append-only data structures. Here's an example. And for those who were at my workshop, we saw it with the bowling example. So what you do is you have a private message. So I am creating a private message and I'm sending it to a different user. And now I want to know this different user if he read it or who read this message if I send it to many people. So what I do is I have a read um, API, which by the way is an irregular verb, so it makes it a bit complicated there. But I simply say read with user and I'm appending to a collection that the message was read by that user. So now what I can do is I just simply go into my private message and I look who read this and I loop through all the records and see who read it and that's it. It's very simple. I'm never going to update, I'm never going to delete. And you see that I didn't say private read left or read right. I said stack of people who read it and when they read it. And for the record, this is the immutable entity then. This is an entity that just has the user message uh, reference and an identifier and it has no API right now. It may have one. You can query the structure and it's not going to change so you can cache this. So it's not a problem. Immutable data is quite simple to, to reason with. Anybody using PSR7? All right, a few people. You may have already um, tried the, uh, well, uh, the awesome sauce that is PSR7. But once you build an object, it is like that. It is going to exist like that. It's not going to change. And 95, I would say 95% of the bugs that I see in code are about why does this variable contain the wrong value? Okay, this is pretty much where bugs come from. You have state, state is the enemy. Every time you have state that changes, it's like a moving target, okay? If you shoot at a target that is fixed, you can hit it very quickly. But try shooting at something that moves. It's gonna be much more complicated. Immutable data can be cached forever. You know it's inserted and only inserted, never deleted, never updated, so you can just put it in a cache and you can access it via that or you can generate any number of views from it and you don't need to regenerate the views for the single elements. Immutable data is very predictable. So you know how big it's gonna be, you know pretty much how it's gonna be had on the long run. And it allows you to do very nice things such as historical analysis. So you can see things such as when was this user the last time online? Or the annoying thing on WhatsApp when you look at WhatsApp and you see if somebody read your message, okay? Um, that is quite interesting. So you can do some interesting queries with this. You may want to look at event sourcing for that. There were, I think, my tutorial and a talk here, so you may already have seen it. Avoid soft deletes. So since we said append only structures, immutable data, um, I wanted to introduce pretty much the death of soft deletes. Soft deletes, they are a very broken idea they come from a world where one database was all you had and you wanted to keep everything there because querying a different database was expensive because storage was expensive and you didn't want to do logging for this stuff and so on. So what I find is that soft deletes pretty much break immutability. You now have some data that is going to change and it's also very difficult to reference it. So Every time you delete an object with a soft delete, you are actually breaking data integrity because the references, they work at, they work at foreign key level, but they will not work in memory because you're not loading the objects. So you start having weird exceptions where it says, I can't find this object, but the object is there. So you also break validity here. It's integrity and validity and so on. And what I find is that most of the cases, in most of the cases, you can replace a soft delete with a different operation. Uh, so I've been working in March for a client um, and they are doing heavy machinery. To give you an idea, heavy machinery means that one machine that they were working with was big as half of this room, okay? It's machines that build cars. So every machine is like building a huge piece of the car. And what happens is that these machines 
they use them when they need to build a new Audi or the new Volkswagen, hopefully one that doesn't break or that doesn't like pollute the planet like they are doing right now. Um, anyway, anytime they build a new car, they build one of those machines. And when the car, when they new make a new model of the car, they are going to pretty much scrap this machine and move it somewhere else. So what they did is they built it with soft deletes. They said, oh, this machine, I'm going to soft delete it because I may reuse it later. You see where the problem is? I'm not taking half a room like this and deleting it. Okay? In the world, you can't destroy matter. So what they did is they actually just dismounted it and moved it to a storage. That's what they did. So what you can do in most cases is just redesign it as a different concept. In this case, it was our hive. You are hive the machine. And people use soft deletes because it is easy to filter by soft delete. The system does it automatically for you. Instead, what you should do is just, in the filter view, you just say, tick, show me the archived machines. And you just add it to the query. All right. Mapping driver choice. This is opinionated. This is my opinion. You can perfectly well use annotations for private packages. If you have things to throw at me, do it now. Um, if you do anything on GitHub or you publish it, please use XML mappings. They are validated. You can extend them. You can replace them very easily. You can't replace an annotation. And nobody really wants to debug YAML anyway. At least I don't want to. I'm sick of YAML. All right. Lazy or eager? Lazy or eager loading. So we're now in the domain of mapping. Eager loading, a lot of people I see, they pretty much start adding eager loading everywhere. Eager loading is pretty much useless. So what the common um, thought is that if you add eager loading, the ORM is going to be doing magic and join things for you. Okay, so there's going to be magic and things that uh, are happening under the hood, and everything is going to be very performant and very fast. That's not really the case. We are good at building this tool, but the tool is quite complicated and it's it's winning. Okay, we are losing on this. So eager loading, just don't use it. On the other side, you may have extra lazy. Extra lazy indicates areas of your domain that are very under high risk. So things such as forum, get blog posts. If you take any forum, it may have millions of blog posts. Okay, if you start with blog, a, a, a forum in uh, well, a message board in 2007, and it's now 2015, that's eight years of history of people writing and writing things. So you have these huge collections of things. So this is a high risk because you reach the limits of what the ORM can do for you. We are talking about larger pieces of data. Remember, I was talking about online transaction processing. So you need be to be very careful about what you're doing here. If you just call the API on a collection in the wrong way, you're going to have a bad day. It's going to try to load all your forum in one shot, and you're going to have very high server load. Bidirectional associations, just try to avoid them. They are a huge overhead. They are a actually very performance affected. Um, you need to code only what affects your domain. So if you have a father to child relation, just make it one direction, depending on which object is the one you are interacting with. So you only code what is really needed for your interactions. If you have complex queries and you need to have the bidirectionality, uh, if it's just for that one query or for just a couple of queries, instead of adding a bidirectional association, you just uh, hack a more complex DQL query and that gets it done for you. This is really a suggestion, just do it like that. Customer repositories. As you see, it's bang, bang, bang suggestions there. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff here. Again, slides are online. Um, customer repositories, they improve expressiveness. So what I find is that people usually extend from the base doctrine repository and start adding methods. What you should do is instead do something like this. Well, assuming you have an interface for it, but you just have your own class. It doesn't extend from anything. 
It just has your custom methods, and internally it may use the other repository. Okay, but what you have is just an API that is very specific to your domain. Now, this is perfectly okay. This works nicely. It's very expressive. But what happens is that um, on a project um, that lasts for a year, you're going to start having 20 methods here. Okay, 20, 30 methods. You're going to start having custom queries everywhere. So what I found is that there is a different approach that works much better, which is query functions. Now, I'm not suggesting using a function, which is kind of messy. I'm suggesting using an object that acts as a function. So what you have is you have something like this. You have, I pretty much moved the name of the method. If you look at the name here, find users that have a monthly subscription. <coughs> I moved it from here into the name of this class. This class is called users that have a monthly subscription. Now the constructor allows me to pass in anything that I need to run the query. And then I have invoke that returns me a traversable, okay, a generator or something like that, with all the results. And this, I find, is very efficient because people stop adding more methods to this. Because this acts as a function. I can use it as a function. And pretty much that intuitive. So you're going to have very, a, a big amount of small little classes that are really easy to find as well. They're all under a, a directory, so you see exactly what you can do in one shot. Repositories are services, so you should treat them as services. The same happens to query functions. They are services. They are configured with an entity manager or something like that. <laughs> so what you should do is you avoid using the object manager get repository. Entity manager get repository for those do who don't know the interface here. That is because get repository is a service locator. Does anybody know the problems with service locators? Come on, what is the problem with service locators? All right, just kidding. All right, a few hands up. But anyway, the point is, when you ask for something to give me something by name, you don't know what you get. It's going to be squishy. It's going to be undefined. It's going to be very messy. So it is a service locator. It comes with all the problems that come with the service locator. There's countless articles out there that tell you about dependence injection and why you should not use a service locator inside your code. What you do is you inject them instead. So you take your object that uses the repository and pass the repository as a constructor argument. That's it, very simple. You can also separate my repository get and my repository find. So what you can start having is different APIs one for getting items and one for finding items. The difference is subtle, but it makes things very, very simple to work with. My repository find can return null. We are searching for something. Okay, find me something. If you can't find anything, just give me null back. But uh, my repository get should never return null. So you can type hint against it, against the return value, so you can also add type safety. Here's an example. We have a blog post repository, get by slug. So we're fetching a blog post by a piece of the URL. And if I can't find the blog post, and I'm going to throw an exception that I can't find the blog post, but I have return type hint, and I'm sure that this API is going to work. So what happens is that if I put this in an application controller or whatever you use there to render your web pages, if your API is not able to find the blog post, it's going to throw an exception. And what you can do is, in your application layer, you can catch that exception and generate a 404 page. So instead of coding the 404 pages in every single endpoint in your application, you just have one catch all at the top level, and you do that. And you can also log them. You can do many, many things here. You don't go crazy with logging and stuff like that. Avoid two-phase comments. So you want to have um, APIs that don't do more than one flush per piece of execution. So what you do is you have unrelated transactions. Every time you switch from one service to the next service, you just clear the entire entity manager and then reload things. Now, this obviously has some disadvantages, but the idea is that it simplifies things by a lot. So you have different boundaries. You have the user service, and then you have the blog post service. Okay, The user service is going to give you an ID of the user, and the blog post service is going to give you IDs for the blog posts. 
But what happens is that these two, they talk via identifiers. They never send a user object into the other service or a blog post into the other service. Because otherwise, you are mixing concerns and you have this two-phase comment thing. OK, now, loads of suggestions here. Let's go to some easier stuff. Uh, keep normalization under control. As I said before, stuff like UADs is fine. Stuff like using JSON fields in a database is perfectly fine. There are even engines that support JSON fields now. Um, you can have XML fields. You can have blob data in the database. It's perfectly OK. Don't worry too much about normalizing it out. So what you need to do is you keep the normalization freaks under control. OK? Just stop it. You don't need to do that. Just, OK? So you may need to gag your DBA. OK, um, or something like that. Um, or maybe just get him to understand what you're trying to do. Instead of like saying, oh, this is the way, and do ivory tower software development, try to get to compromises. It's never going to be perfect uh, because people are stubborn. I am right. You are wrong. It's always like that. OK? But they really need to understand your needs. Uh, a database architect is an architect. So his work is understanding your needs and designing something that fits your needs. It's not about imposing his rules that he learned in school onto you. And the same as well. You are not going to impose your rules on him. So you can't just say, this is how I do it, and that's it. You have to kind of get to compromises. And that is because academic and practical knowledge may, vary, may differ by a lot. Uh, we saw a lot of changes. A lot of people are using this NoSQL database that I personally don't use and don't really like, but you see that it's very different from what the old Unix people kind of designed. They are very smart people. They built very nice things, but you know some of the things that they say are not very practical in the real world. So you need to come to compromises. What about performance? Uh, performance um, in the ORM has its own topic. I did another talk. So we're going to skip on this. There was an entire talk about this. I think you had enough on this. So you need to know all the details in this. We're going to skip on that. So what you need to do is you profile your application. You take it and throw it at X debug and start profiling. Or throw it at something like, I don't know, there's like Blackfire, I think. There's stuff like, um, uh, I can't remember the names of the tools. But there's all profiling tools that uh, measure the uh, CPU load, the database query count on your system, the number of exceptions. You need to keep it monitored and be sure of what you're doing. Measuring is the only way to get performance. It's not about designing everything up front perfectly, in my opinion. You can, of course, design everything up front per uh, perfectly, but you're never going to sell a product then. Okay? You're never going to get anything out uh, of your work. So there are other talks about this. But of course, you need to know a bit about software engineering and why this may be slow and this may be fast. But instead of focusing on micro-optimizations, you need to measure. Good. Let's recap. First of all, domain first. You start from your business use cases, start designing from there. And anything that comes out of there, then you design the mappings, and then you design the database. But your business domain should work without your application and without your database. It should just work. All the entities should just work without ORM, without database, and without mapping, and without your application. Do not normalize anything without a need for it. A need means there is some foreign key integrity, there is an index performance, there is some reason why this solution is better than the other. There must be a strong reason. Otherwise, you're just building yourself your own grave. You're making it complicated, and it's going to be a bit messy to deal with. Consider using separate databases. You are not required to make everything go through the ORM. Transactional data is not reporting data. Dealing with payments is different from dealing with counting all the payments that happened in the last 10 years. Okay? There are different things. Executing a payment is a very different problem from doing analytics on your payments. And that is it. Thank you very much.
Are there any questions? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, well, what you can do is you can, instead of soft deleting the data, you can just take your data and push it to a separate database in a log or something like that and actually delete it. You can do that. Or you can move it to a separate table, which is archived. You can copy it to a different structure. But you don't keep it in place, because if you keep it in place, you're going to have foreign key integrity issues. You're going to have problems with uh, uh, primary uh, with unique keys, <laughs> like a user. When you delete a user, somebody needs to be able to register with that email. If your user is still there and you have a soft delete, then you have a problem. Soft deleting and duplicated data. Duplicated data is fine because you can put a time on it and you can recompute whatever you want from that time. You can reconstruct state from the logs so you don't need to go crazy and design things around duplicated data there. Any other questions? All right. Right, so the question is uh, DTOs, um, if you should use a, create an empty user and then copy the data to the user. Yes, what you have is you have a different class, which is user form DTO or something like that, user registration form DTO. You bind that to the form, then you put data in there, and then you move it to the user object, like later you create a user. So that's how, how it works. You just have this DTO, which is filled with data from the form, and now you can give it to the, f to the user object. Right? All right, it gets a bit noisy, so I'm going to skip over next questions. Just hit me up. Thank you.